Okay, my friends, Roger once again, Mud Fossil University, and you know I have discovered things that are quite extraordinary here on Earth, including dragons and all giant humans and all kinds of things that were written about. And now I, as a result, have gone back through everything that I can find in history. And this just popped up. Somebody sent me this this morning, so as soon as I saw this, I thought of you. And I'm very, very pleased that they did. Now, this is by the Ancient Astronaut Archive. It just came out August 1st of this year, 2020, and it talks about the law of the sea. Well, it's very long. It's two hours, and I'm just starting to get into it. And uh, I can see it's going to be extremely good. It's very detailed. And Sitchin had a very deep understanding of what these ancient tablets said. And they detailed in pretty good description what did actually happen, they say, and and it was dismissed, of course, by academia, which dismisses everything that they can't account for, and they tried to destroy Sitch, and I think he was okay, but, you know, Velikowski was put out this in the woods, and, you know, same thing that happened to me, and the same thing that happens to anybody that steps up. However, these guys, we're learning now from YouTube and from TV and from all of these different outliers in the science field that want true answers. And this is one of the places. I'm very, very, very um, impressed by this ancient astronaut, Arca. And I'm impressed by a lot of them now. And they're doing real good work. And we want to understand it. So I'm going to kick in here and there. But this law of the seed, we're going back to Nibiru, from those from heaven that came to earth. And her earth was not occupied. It was not a planet that had any, anything going on here. And Nibiru, which goes 3,600 years around the sun, it goes way out, and then it comes back in close to the sun, and way out again. Now, it was run by god kings. It's the way I'm looking at it. And there was a war on the planet, and they end, and ended up getting out of the war by uniting the factions by marriage. And what happened was one guy married his brother's daughter or something like that, and ended up she, he couldn't have a, a, a kid with her because it's obviously the same. They, he went out and he, he had a kid with a concubine, is what the way I understand it. So that kid became the new heir. And then she got pregnant, apparently, with his kid. And so there was another kid. So we got one that is not from both of them. And then we got one that is from both of them. That started a big succession war, like, apparently. And that's where we're going to start getting into it now. But that was called the law of the seed, which meant anybody that had a kid from a half-sister, that kid would always take over. And I guess that became the practice, it sounds like to me. Marry, you know, somebody to say either your half-sister or your half, your brother's kid or something like that. I don't know. It's very... I'm just starting to get into it, so it's going to get a little trickier. But if you're interested, this is a very long video, but I'm going to watch it for sure. Original Synopsis of the Lost Book of Enki. And that was by Sitchin. He originally did the translations. And again, very hard to be accepted in, to even be looked at. Or, or to, let me put it this way. It's very hard to speak because you're going to get destroyed. They'll do everything they can to make you stop speaking. That's the best way I can put it. Okay, this is where I'm going to need a little help understanding, because I think Anshar and Kishar and all that are, they were like people, it sounded to me, like kings and queens, and now all of a sudden they appear to be planets. Now listen to this. ...for nearly nine complete shars during which the atmospheric environment of Nibiru grew ever worse. During the ninth Shar, Anu challenged Alelu to hand-to-hand -hand combat. Anu won the competition and assumed kingship in the palace. Alelu escaped Nibiru in a celestial chariot and set his coordinates to Earth. The beginning of Tablet 2 describes Alelu's journey to Earth. Inki explains that as Alelu departed Nibiru, he observed the huge breach in its atmosphere. After traveling a great distance in dark space, 
Alelu was relieved when he spotted Little Gaga, also known as Pluto. After passing Little Gaga... No, this, listen to this. The names of the planets, it sounds like to me. Gaga, Alelu encountered the outer planets one by one. First, Antu, then came On, next came Anshar, and finally Kishar. Anshar and Kishar. I thought those... Let's take another look at it. All right, I'm, I'm not trying to take away from anybody's presentation or or steal anybody's work. I'm just trying to understand it. Because at this point, it was taught, called the Law of the Seed, where you had to be related, and the best relation you could be would be to be the, the son of uh, a half-sister, it sounds like to me. It's crazy, but listen to what they have to say. My point being is Kishar and Anshar didn't appear to be planets, but now all of a sudden they showed up as planets. Here goes. Whereby a son by a half-sister, whenever born, will rise above all for succession. Kishagal's son, named Anshar, became... Anshar and Kishar, his son. Now listen, this has really got me for a loop here, guys. Somebody help me. Kishagal's son, named Anshar, became heir to the throne and the fifth king of Nibiru. Anshar took his half-sister named Kishar as his spouse. Inki explains that it was during Anshar's reign when the Nibiruans discovered a breach in their atmosphere. Anshar and Kishar were unable to overcome the severe climate change and their son, Inshar, inherited the coming global disaster. Inshar spent several circuits around our solar system studying the atmospheres of Nibiru's planetary neighbors. Even so, he was unable to devise a solution for the atmospheric degradation, and it grew worse. It sounds to me like these were people, like, hanging around in here trying to make these decisions. And then, as we just heard, as, um, I guess it was Alulu or whatever it was, he, he was coming through the solar system and he passed Anshar and Kishar. What's that all about? All right, one more last time. Listen carefully. Who won the competition and assumed kingship in the palace. Alelu escaped Nibiru in a celestial chariot and set his coordinates to Earth. All right, they're coming to Earth to get the gold. And that's how they de de uh, the develop of mankind. Describes Alelu's journey to Earth. Inky explains that as Alelu departed Nibiru, he observed the huge breach in its atmosphere. After traveling a great distance in dark space, Alelu was relieved when he spotted Little Gaga, also known as Pluto. After passing Little Gaga, Alelu encountered the outer planets one by one. First Antu, then came On, next came Anshar, and finally Kishar. Those planets were described to me as as people or creatures that were were in control on Nibiru, like you know people like us. It sounded like you know I mean maybe godly, but still not planets. Now all of a sudden they're planets. But when things explode and I see body parts in space, I. I <laughs> There's a lot to think about here, but anyway, I'm going to let it go for another minute or so. After passing Kishar, Alelu reached the most treacherous part of his journey, the hammered bracelet, also known as the asteroid belt. After you Now, the asteroid belt, the hammered bracelet, is just a ton of rocks. And in my world, in my way of thinking, those rocks are the body structures from creatures or a creature that it was exploded likely by whoever God is that is in control of this whole system because Satan was on this planet this is the fifth planet and this was supposed to be called I think it was called Rahab something like that and it was the domain of Satan and you know, we see the we see the dragons all over the earth. We see these things now. Now I don't even know how much they knew back then. You know what this was because they just called it the hammered bracelet. They did. I don't know if they talk about it being a planet being destroyed. But here goes. Using missiles to clear a path, he completed his perilous flight through the belt. Soon thereafter, Alelu sped past Mars and arrived at Earth. 
Upon his arrival at Earth, Alelu conducted a planetary sensor sweep and determined gold was present in abundance. All right, gold, as you, you know, if you've been following my work, is nothing more than part of the transition metals that are in creatures' bodies. The creatures' bodies that were on Earth were so gigantic that when they drowned in the flood that God brought onto the Earth, and I don't know if the Sumerians knew about that, or whether it didn't happen later because the gold is pre pre precipitates out in the blood and it actually ends up con collecting in veins of gold, veins and arteries. I'll show you that and then we'll start thinking about this a little more. All right, <clears throat> rather than go through all this again, this is BBC News. This was back in 2018. Huge gold and cross rocks unearthed in Australia. This is the Beta Hunt Mine. They had to go 1,600 feet deep. But when they did, they came up with one rock was 2,400 ounces of gold. Now listen to this. This is funny. This is this Beta Hunt Mine producing these giant chunks of gold. Listen to what it says down here. Gold mineralization occurs mainly in the Lunan basalt, which is the foot wall. <laughs> they have no clue what they just said. It's the foot. This is what happens to them. The gold collects as it runs down the veins and it starts to plug up and it backs up because of specific gravity. They will accumulate in chunks in certain areas, but these are going to be the deepest part of the foot. Usually, if it was standing up and submerged and floated for a long time, all of the heavy metals would sink to the bottom. That's what happened there. And here's another one. Now, the gold will separate out. You see, that's not gold completely here. This is the gold gold. It's specifically due to, due to specific gravity. All right, once again, I'm not trying to steal anybody's work or, or um, take it as my own. And this is electric universe eyes. I'm strictly trying to understand. And this is about the Hebrew cosmology and the ages, the planet ages by Emmanuel Velikovsky, who was my hero. He went back and researched all of the ancient texts. Now listen to this. This is nicely done. Again, electric universe eyes. Very, very nicely done. And uh, listen to what it has to say. Very interesting. Because this somehow has to work in with the... Nibiru texts. And this appears to have happened long before Nibiru ever existed because Earth didn't exist at this point. This is Electric Universe Eyes and today I'm back from the Velikovsky archive and want to talk about two topics, the Hebrew cosmogony and the planet ages. The Hebrew cosmogony. This world came into existence out of a chaos of fluid driven by a divine blast. This is the epic beginning of the book of Genesis. Quote, the earth was chaotic and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God's wind moved upon the face of the fluid. End quote. From this prime... Now, this apparently started the material realm, it sounds like to me. And another thing that Tyson brought up in Genesis, I, it appears, and I haven't really gone back, I want to go through Genesis, I want to go through the whole thing, how it all started, and look at it in a materialistic way. Because I say that there is nothing that exists that is not electrons. Electrons, and electrons are light. Okay, electrons in their, in their base raw form are just basically light. So, what Tyson mentioned was he said, the first words were, let there be light. It wasn't like, let there be planets, let there be rocks. It says, let there be light. And then there was light. And then it says, he separated the, the, the waters that were above from the waters below. Light is nothing more than, literally, it is water as well. It creates water. And there's at a certain point, there's the ionosphere, which they would call the firmament. And that separates the waters above, which is the fine... Uh, ether of space, which is nothing more than the same thing. It's the particles from the waters below. And we know we have waters in the air. We're going to get a tropical storm today. So, you know, that's just, the, it, but it does not exist up above a certain layer, which is the ionosphere. And then there's all kinds of 
things that the Bible said that certainly were correct. Now, there's things I can't account for, obviously, but I can account for a lot of them being accurate. Now, I'm going to take the overwhelming evidence of accuracy against the minimal evidence of you know, like something that people go, oh, you can't go with that because it says in the Bible that the earth is stationary and it's on this and it does that and it's flat and all kinds of things. Well, <clears throat> I can almost go with a f one at one time. It was an accretion disc, disc spinning and it's flat. But there's, oh, no, no, it can't spin. See, you, you, can, you can never win with the details. But I got enough details to show me that virtually everything is made out of biology. Everything I know for a fact, everything is made out of electrons. In my world, 100%. And in, also in my world, 100% of that light ended up creating life. That's what I'm seeing.